organization that is a diversity consulting organization. And over the years, uh, we have actually uh, provided leadership development for 4,000 uh, executives and professionals of color. It's uh, been a journey for me um, being at the partnership. Uh, what led me to the partnership was um, really when President Obama appointed me to be uh, the U.S. representative to uh, the United Nations for the 65th General Assembly. And it was a really humbling experience. Each year, the president has the opportunity to appoint someone outside of the State Department to be a part of the delegation. And this was a role that Eleanor Roosevelt filled, Coretta Scott King filled, and then I had the opportunity to fill. So you can imagine how humbling this experience was. And when you stand up on the stage of the United Nations um, at that iconic um, podium, and you look out amongst the sea of ambassadors, it hits you that the world is primarily black and brown and yellow by the ambassadors that you see. And so when I came back to Boston, I wanted to help Boston to be more, to be more reflective of the United Nations. And so I left my job at John Hancock and took on this role at the partnership as CEO in order to help companies advance um, in diversity. And so that's what I've been doing these last six years, and that's what led me to write Success Through Diversity. Now, we were talking earlier, and while I might be passionate about diversity, I only want to approach diversity from a business perspective. I don't want to approach it from my passion. I want to approach it from why is it good for business? And so thus, the tagline, why the most inclusive companies will win, because it's about winning. So let me share with you this story. Toy giant Mattel is another example of a company that catapulted its business forward by appealing to a diverse marketplace. For decades, since its debut in 1959, the Barbie doll, flawlessly thin, high-heeled, and white-skinned, was a cultural sensation and one of the world's best-selling toys. Over the years, Mattel modestly diversified the toy's occupations and ethnicities, creating a Barbie businesswoman, 1963, a Barbie astronaut, 1965, an African-American Barbie, 67, and a Barbie surgeon, 73. Mattel's efforts enabled the doll to maintain about a 90% market share in girl-oriented toys for most of the 20th century. By the mid-2000s, Barbie's dominance and brand appeal began to lag. After four straight quarters of plummeting sales, it was no longer the best-selling doll. The brand was losing relevance, said Lisa McKnight, senior vice president at Mattel. We knew we had to change the conversation. A creative team within Mattel worked for two years under the secretive code Project Dawn 
began Barbie's modern makeover, designing a more inclusive set of dolls that more accurately reflected the size and complexion of America's children. In 2015, Mattel unleashed the fruits of Project Dawn, launching a new generation of dolls, complete with curvy body sizes, 23 hair colors, 22 hairdos, 18 eye colors, and an array of skin tones. This product launch, Mattel's most significant rebranding effort to date, has proven revitalizing and lucrative. Parents and children alike flocked to the ethnically, racially, and bodily diverse product lines. Barbie became the most diverse doll product line, and at the Toy Industry Association's annual Toy of the Year Awards in 2017, the company won the coveted Doll of the Year Award. This new generation of Barbies wouldn't have been possible without a diverse workforce inside Mattel. To help design a culturally sensitive and compelling black Barbie, for example, the company's marketing teams consulted with Mattel's African American Forum, the toy maker's African American Employee Resource Group. Members help get the dolls' names, skin tone, and hair just right. They asked us very candid questions about the look of the doll. Did they get the skin tone right? What about the nose and the hair, said David Simmons, associate manager of account planning and a member of the ERG group. This was important because consumers roundly criticize the 1967 African-American Barbie, colored Francie, for her inauthenticity. Besides having a darker skin tone, she lacked any bodily features or hairstyles typical of African-Americans. As African-American Tom Burrell, a diversity advertising trailblazer, famously quipped, black people are not dark-skinned white people. A lack of authenticity plagued previous Barbie diversity efforts as well. With the wheelchair-bound Share a Smile Becky doll, 1997, lacking the correct proportions to fit into her dream house elevator, and the computer engineer Barbie product line requiring help from boys to actually code. However, for its 2016 line of gamer Barbies, Mattel drew on female engineer leaders, such as Molly Prophet, CEO of Kerchunk Games, Julie Ann Crumpet, entertainment industry editor-in-chief at Google, and Kimberly Bryant, founder of Black Girls Code, to help it design a compelling doll that resembled a real tech Geek. These women advise Mattel during their, ed, during their design process, ensuring the new career game developer Barbie was authentic, compelling, and would help inspire a new generation of budding female computer scientists and STEM leaders. The computer has JavaScript on it, and you can see various instances of game engines on her laptop, said one of the leaders, commenting on the new line. 
I really know the girls need an icon that shows them they can be part of the tech space. And Barbie does that. She has the power to tell girls they can be makers and builders. Even Barbie's companion, Ken, received a totally diversity makeover in 2017. Prior to the new iteration of Ken dolls, Barbie's plastic bow typically sported blonde hair, blue eyes, and a chiseled figure. Revamped Ken comes in one case with a man bun, while another sports a dad bod, a Fortune article observed. All of this increased diversity has led to more prosperity for the company. Mattel's brunette Latina Barbie with curves and brown eyes became the company's 2016 best seller, a feat the Huntington Post senior reporter Emily Peck calls a clear victory for the toy maker giant. Following four years of declines, sales of the dolls increased 7% in 2016, earning nearly a billion dollars for the company, certainly proving that diversity sells. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad that you shared that excerpt because it, it really leads into the first question that I wanted to ask you, and that is, as a woman of color writing a book about diversity, you took the lens of not moral compass leading or anything that would say, as a human being, this makes sense, but you instead went the route of really highlighting why as a business, like you said about the tagline, why it'll make you win or why it is a business case. Can you speak to why you went that route when mm -hmm. writing the book? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, um, we are in business, and at the end of the day, we want to win. And we have to approach things from the bottom line. And so when we look at diversity, we want to look at the changing landscape. Um, it's important for us to understand this changing demographic shift we are experiencing. Today, there are more babies of color born in this country than Caucasian babies. Today, there are more students of color in this country than Caucasians. In 2042, the Census Bureau indicates that there will be more people of color in America than Caucasians. That's our workforce. That's our marketplace. And so in order for us to produce goods and services for our marketplace and for our global marketplace, I talked about the UN, we need to have individuals in our companies that are reflective of our marketplace. And so it only stands to reason that we want to have a diverse workforce. And then you look at all the studies. You look at the McKenzie studies that indicates the more diverse workforces are the more profitable workforces. Because again, at the end of the day, you want diversity of thought. And the best way to get diversity of thought is to have people not only with different experiences, but different cultures, and who can add a different lens to a problem. And so diversity is critical. There's a new study that came out that said that the more innovative companies, the companies that are more diverse are, be, are the more innovative companies. The more innovative companies are producing more patents, and when they did the studies, those innovative companies were the diverse companies. The more diverse companies produce more 
innovative companies and more patents and receive more patents. I definitely can believe that. And I'm sure you know Google's goal is to be among the most innovative of companies. Oh, absolutely. To be on the cutting edge. So then the next question I have for you stems off of that same thought. If I know there are some folks in the room that are actually on our like recruiting teams, but a lot of this office in particular don't um, really have a touch point with our recruiting or hiring and HR teams heavily engineering, how would you say for those who are interested in kind of seeing the needle move here but don't really work in a role where they can directly hire, let's say, more diverse talent to get us that innovation that you were speaking about, how can we still kind of show our passion for this or try to make some progress on the topic, although it's not necessarily a part of our like core roles here at Google? It is a part of your core roles. Um, and it's important for you to understand how much influence millennials have. Today, there are more millennials than baby boomers. And corporate understands that millennials are our leaders and our future leaders. And your voice is incredibly powerful. And corporate and executives understand that millennials think differently and understand that you have a lot of options. And they understand that you care deeply about values and that a company has to have ethics and values. And if you say this is important, it becomes important to the company. Um, I can give you an example. Um, Charlottesville um, occurred. And there were a number of companies where the CEO wrote a letter to their employee population saying, this is not who we are. We condemn this. And as recently as six months ago, I was speaking to um, a HR executive um, here in Boston, and they said to me, you know, we still are feeling the effects of not coming out and saying something at Charlottesville. And so your voice is important. And so employees, if, if diversity is important to you, and it is, millennials are far more diverse than baby boomers. It's what you know. Um, you don't want to be living in, or working in a society where there is just one of, of any kind. You value diversity you are really stimulated by it. And so if you say this is important for your growth and development, your executive management will respond to that. And so I would say give voice to this and say it is important for you and that it is something you are willing to step up and help take responsibility for and help be on teams to help increase the diversity of your organization. We can accept that charge. <laughs> That's a really good idea. I know that one reason a lot of times we see that women of color or women in general or any underrepresented minority maybe um, is not seen progressing through corporate America as quickly is due to unconscious biases that we may hold. And Google has, like I think many companies, we have an uncon unconscious bias training that all employees have to take. Um, but I know that you've actually spoken out saying that you don't necessarily believe in having a mandatory unconscious bias training. Can you speak to why that is and what might work better? Well, I don't personally want to go to a class called unconscious bias. You know, I think that the term makes you feel, it puts you, it <laughs> makes you tense. And so I do want to go to a forum, a class, um, on leading for the future. And that's what we call our forums at the partnership, you know, leading for the future. 
Um, and so we talk about, you know, what does that look like? You know, what does the population look like? What are the technologies going to look like? There is so much change. Um, and because there is so much change, what would get in the way of us accepting this change? And so we begin to peel back the onion that way, and that's how we get at unconscious bias. But I find uncomfortable going to a session called unconscious bias. I much rather go to a session called leading for the future, because all of us want to be good leaders. And then we find out, OK, well, what might get in the way of us being a good leader? And something that gets in the way of us being a good leader is this unconscious bias, which we all have. And one of the things that I always do is in this leading for the future forum is I tell people of my bias. When I walked into the partnership, um, the partnership had all women. And I love being a woman. And so the personal side of me was most comfortable uh, with that. But I also knew that I was missing something from an organizational standpoint. And so my first few hires were men. And my culture shifted in the organization. It expanded. We had perspectives that were not there. And so my organization was better because we opened up the organization so that it was more diverse. And while we're an organization that focuses on ethnic diversity, we have individuals who are white who work in our organization. Because I don't want to have one of any kind. Um, I want our organization to be reflective of the world, to be reflective of organizations, and we are going to build together. Um, so uh, unconscious bias, first let's think about why and who we are and what our own biases are, and let's check them at the door before we come into the organization. I love that. You should teach us our unconscious bias training and we can change the name. you can tell us that that was that was really um, thoughtful thank you for sharing that I know that you were speaking about your goals for the partnership and your um, employees and what you would like to to see reflected there we as a company and I'm sure many companies are also trying to diversify the pipeline and make sure that we've got talent coming in but a lot of times folks say, well, there's just not there. We're looking for this role, and we are not seeing a lot of um, minority groups represented for this specific role or job. What do you say to that, and how would you challenge folks to, to resolve that issue for their company? Well, first of all, let me tell you that I don't use the word minority. Okay. Because in the world, people of color are not the minority. In Boston, uh, people of color are 54% of the population, so we're not the minority. So I call us people of color rather than minority. And the word minority has a certain connotation as well. So I use the word people of color. Um, so I encourage people to do that uh, as well. Um, and I encourage people to move beyond the traditional recruiting um, sources. Um, we have 4,000 individuals who have been through the partnership training programs. Next month, Carmen will be training over 250, I think you have, starting. There are people who are in our greater Boston area, um, you have to look beyond the traditional sources. You went to Howard University. 
there is a Howard University alumni chapter here in Boston. That's a great place to start. Here at the partnership, we've created a job board um, for companies who want to be able to advertise their jobs through us because individuals know it's to, that people who are advertising uh, on the partnerships job board website really value diversity. Um, so there are ways that you can approach and find and resource people of color. One of the strategies that I mention in the book is the Rooney Rule. And that is to say that when you have a job open, um, to ensure that you interview diverse talent. You don't fill that job unless you have a diverse pool. Now, we're not telling you to hire a diverse talent, but we're telling you to make sure that the pool is diverse. And this rule comes uh, from the NFL when they tried uh, to increase diversity amongst uh, their coaches. And uh, it just so happened uh, that they were at its peak when one Super Bowl, uh, they had two African Americans playing against each other, two coaches. Um, but for a long time, there was no uh, coaches uh, who were African American. Now, we still have a long way to go, and we know we still have a long way to go with the NFL. But the Rooney Rule is really an opportunity for us to ensure our pools are diverse. Managers can select whomever, but at least we're seeing, we're, we're being intentional about seeing candidates of color. That makes a lot of sense. I know that there are some folks in the audience who might also have questions. Hey, thank you so much. Hi. The excerpt was excellent. I'm really excited to read the rest. Oh, thank you. And I was wondering, what were some of the biggest challenges for you in writing this book? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I think the, some of the biggest challenges were finding companies that had really excelled and were exceptional. Um, and I was able to find Hallmark Health, who had used the Rooney Rule and seen their profits go up. So it's one thing to use the Rooney Rule, but I wanted to be able to relate that to profitability. And so in interviewing their CEO, they attributed that to their profitability. So I was glad to see that. And then um, the other challenge uh, was to be able to find uh, CEOs who would be able to indicate what they did wrong. And none of us want to indicate what we did wrong. And so those were the biggest challenges. But that's a great question. So thank you. Hi there. Thanks for coming today. Hi. Um, I, do, I was curious, as you were doing your research, was there a certain industry that excels in this area? And if they do excel in this area, are they as equally successful in retention as well as recruiting? Uh, are there things that we can learn from other industries that might be doing it better than ours? Yeah. Um, and along those lines, if they are successful in the recruiting methods, um, is there something they partner with retention methods as well that helps them be successful? Yeah, um, I found that the finance, finance industry um, is particularly good at it because they've been doing it a longer period of time, number one. Um, and recruiting is certainly linked to retention. Um, and there's one finance company that has 27 ERGs in their organizations. Do you know what ERGs are? Employee resource groups. 
27. So they have a resource group for every difference. So people feel valued there and that they um, can, um, their difference is valued, it's supported by their company, um, and that um, they think twice about leaving um, because ERGs are really a core part of the business. The other thing that I found is that ERGs are merging or moving towards business resource groups. So the, the Mattel story, so it's just not an ERG now that companies are using the ERGs as business resource groups. And they are being valued even more and being brought into the business. And that's really helpful for employees and it's helpful for companies as well. Great questions. I actually have one more question. Yes, please. Um, do you find that there's any particular, whether it be finance or another industry or company that's really um, skilled at upward mobility for people of color? Um, I, so it's something we talk about all the time. We, I sit on the university programs team and we do university recruiting and so forth. And we control so much of the student's experience on campus. Um, and like, we want to make sure that we want to set them up for success wherever they go. So whether they end up at Google or they end up somewhere else, we want to make sure they're having a good experience and that when they get there, they can really flourish. Um, so there's a lot of companies, I can imagine, that do pretty well recruiting and retaining, um, but don't necessarily see people of color moving up at the same rate uh, as other folks. Are there any companies that you notice through your research that are really good at promoting upper mobility for people of color? Uh, the company that in Boston that I uh, think does it best is Eastern Bank. And that's because of the executive leadership of that company. Um, so Bob Rivers is the chairman and CEO um, and um, is actually named after Robert Kennedy. And so takes the issue of diversity and inclusion very personally um, and chose specifically when expanding the business, chose to expand in areas like Lawrence and Lowell and was able to make the business case for moving into those socioeconomic depressed areas and, and build those areas and make money. Um, in that company, the chair of the board is an African-American woman, and she succeeded an African-American male chair. Bob's successor, the vice chair of the board and president, is an African-American male. Um, when he started, 90% of the board was white male. And now, 50% of the board are women, people of color, or LGBT. Um, and that is then, that attracts a whole set of people who want to be able to work for a company because the culture has shifted. So at the end of the day, what is happening with diversity, it's all about culture. And you, you have to create a culture where difference is valued, where, not dif where difference is not tolerated, where your difference is an asset, where your difference is valued and can be seen as a business value. And that is why people will stay. And so when you're bringing in these students, you, and if you don't have it, if you don't have it all together, you ask them for their help. You say, here's where we wanna be, and we're not here yet, but we need your help. And help us get there empower them to help shape your culture. Thank you for coming. Um, 
it sounds like uh, the, the book and a lot of your work is in the business context. I'm definitely super interested in reading it. I'm curious, though, uh, to what degree you've run into similar issues in other domains, like politics, for example, if you have any stories or research uh, that might not be included in the book that you could share about that. In terms of? In terms of the value of diversity and, and the way it can benefit uh, countries or political systems in addition to businesses. Oh, um, well, yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> um, yes, well, the world is changing. Um, and so it's so important uh, for us to be accepting. We look at our country, and it's really important for us to understand that the landscape and the demographics of our country it's shifting, and it's important that we accept that, um, and that we understand that at the end of the day, everyone in this country is an immigrant. Everyone comes from that background, um, and that um, we need to not hold on to power but we need to open the door for others, um, just as others have opened the door for us when we came. And that's the challenge we're experiencing now in our country, um, that there are so many who are fearful of the change, the changing demographics and want things to remain the same. But they're not going to remain the same. The numbers are changing. And so it is best for us to look at the advantages that diversity brings, as opposed to fear it. Um, look at the advantages of what different cultures bring to this country. It's who we are. Um, and not fear the change um, that is coming. Um, and understand that if we continue to resist, the rest of the world is going to pass us by. And so it's so important that we focus on the best side of us and not our fears. So I'm recently, um, I live in the city of Boston, and I'm in the process of enrolling my kids into, the, um, you know, into a school system. And what I noticed was uh, I was attending a few sessions on various programs, but Boston public schools have a, a graduation, a high school graduation rate um, in the 60s. And so you take a look around at the Boston public school system, and it's largely a lot of, I know you like the word minorities, it's usually a lot of people of color yeah. that have no other option but the public school system, right. which I think a lot of people agree is largely broken. <laughs> and I think in order for, you know, for people to, of color to have the same opportunities to get into companies that, you know, like Google or like the banks you're talking about that have all these resources, they need to be exposed to kind of that environment and that as a path for, you know, when they grow up, this is what you can have a career in. And I feel like if, you know, if we have a, something like a 60% graduation rate in the Boston public schools, it, it just doesn't seem like doesn't, there's no funnel of talent, um, kind of, at least in the city of Boston. And so I guess I was wondering if you had any thoughts of, you know, I know you, a lot of your work has been with companies, but how can we, you know, as, you know, as a, a larger company in, in Boston area, how can we help um, improve that graduation, high school graduation rate? Um, well, first of all, the, as you know, this is the educational mecca of the world. And so there should be no reason why we should have that rate. Um, but what we need to do as corporations is to partner with our public school systems, partner with uh, our city halls uh, to help uh, address the issues, uh, to help, because this is our future workforce. Um, so we were just at um, Biogen the other day, and they have this wonderful 
a community lab where they have um, students coming in and they're teaching students science. Uh, but this is a real opportunity to take students and bring them into companies so that they can learn and can see that they can work here too. There are a number of different programs, but I do believe each company should be engaged in the community and have programs connected to the public school system because that just makes good business sense. Uh, so whether it's adopt a school or whether it's you know going across industry and um, teaching across um, the school system, uh, but we need to realize this is our future, and we won't succeed as a business community with an uneducated um, workforce in uh, our public system. So I know that a lot of times when people are going into some of the biggest, most celebratory moments or um, moments that become ones that they're most proud of, for me, I'm, I'm reflecting on your time uh, at the UN um, General Assembly, those are preceded by things that maybe are a little more challenging or you don't know that that's coming and you can be kind of going through a time of either um, complacency in what you've been doing or um, trying to switch gears or change gears. And I know as folks trying to move through corporate America, folks can be in jobs for a while and then you know kind of get antsy for that next big thing or that next large opportunity that could be coming. And your career has been full of very large <laughs> opportunities and really amazing work. Has there ever been a time when you were going into something and you didn't necessarily see your way or weren't aware that that was that next big thing was coming? And how did you navigate that um, stage before the time where you were moving into the next big thing? You always create opportunities. You, you know, you never wait um, for anything. Um, you uh, put yourself in creative environments like this. You always. Um, think of ways to open doors for the next generation. Um, you come up with creative ideas uh, to bring along others. I'm so cognizant that you know so many people fought and died and sacrificed um, so that I could be sitting here, so that you could be sitting there. So my job is so small compared to what others have done uh, for me. So there's always work to do, and we all have a responsibility to uh, develop the next generation of leaders. And that requires a lot of work, whether it's the Boston public school system, which is something you're focusing on, or whether it's developing um, leaders at our C-suite level in the partnership. Um, but you never wait for anything. You always focusing. You are, you are always focused on building and developing because others fought and died so that we could be sitting here. And we have a job to do. Thank you all for your time and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.